why I was asking to do so much. So, out of Egypt, have I called my son? Out of Egypt, let's bring forth. Out of Ethiopia, let's bring forth. Out of Africa, let's bring forth none other than our revered elder, Dr. Yosef ben -Yepinin. Good afternoon. <clears throat> you must excuse my hostness, but uh, as you were told, because of the bad weather in uh, Michigan, and I was running around this week preparing to uh, bury a brother of, of mine not biologically, but an adopted brother. We were so close for so many years that if we were biologically, it couldn't be any different. A brother who just passed after six days of marriage uh, at 71, he had a massive heart attack. So the irony is that he married uh, on a Wednesday. The next Wednesday morning he was dead. And the following Wednesday coming up, he will be ritualized, and the third and the next day after, he will be interned. Uh, many of you may have known of him. Uh, he was once the greatest jazz violinist in the United States, Mr. Aubrey Welch. He drew from professional music because he refused to allow drugs to be used in his quartet and went and then went to drive a taxi and subsequently retired but still played music for shut-ins and hospitals and so forth and sometimes in the summer in the park and uh, parks department as a matter of fact he was going to play for the group sponsoring next week's uh, dinner uh, at Camp, at Camp Minnesing. Uh Now he's passed away. The, the, to me, it was worse than that because I introduced him to the lady he married. Uh, I, sat, I stood for, as the best man at the wedding and all of that. Uh, every morning that I was in the United States and wasn't traveling outside of New York, we had breakfast together so you could understand that uh, when he died, suddenly, it was a shock, uh, a particular shock to me, and I had to work with his wife and his brother in preparing for the funeral rites starting this Wednesday coming. So between those two things, uh, as our brother said, the body finally said it had to rest, and I lay down, but then Sister Keffer called me and reminded me that I was to come here today. I, I, I had, it slipped me because I was sleeping, but I got up to the task. So I beg you for forgiveness for not having my voice in the proper manner. It was interesting to come today and to see the video, uh, the Gil Noble video dealing with Rabbi Setzer. Uh, some years ago, or a few, uh, two or three years ago, I guess it was. And because the topic of the day falls just in line, understanding Al Kebelan's original philosophical ethical masterpiece, I must equally add to this a situation that took place not too long ago. And I was at that time on the Gary Bird show, which was held at the Apollo Theater before it was moved back downtown. At that time, a flash came over the radio and the television and other media, and it was a big affair about the release of Mandela. 
Gary Bird on the show turned to me and asked me what I thought about it. It was, of course, he too was elated. And I stopped and I asked him what he said. And he said, Mandela was released. Just within a few minutes ago, what I thought of it. I said, all I thought about it is that many would no longer have to masturbate. I, I read her. She would no longer have to hold a pillow, and he would no longer have to masturbate. <laughs> and everybody thought I was crude. As a matter of fact, the next persons to come in front of uh, Brother Bird's radio started to lambast me for the lack of feelings. But I realized then, as I realized now, I wasn't going to change my statement because my statement was based upon research as I didn't state, change my statement when Rabbi Selsa started his attack. You should have been after the show in the blue room downstairs when Rabbi Selsa did another dance. And, and that was the, I didn't know you were Jewish dance. But, but that didn't change anything because I had already told Rabbi Selsa what it was right there on the radio. And of course, he had another paper that he had come with, and that's why the anti-Semitism paper, which he could not use. I think that you now realize what I knew about Mandela, because you have seen where Mandela and others have seen and given the clear total commitment of the people he allegedly leads that the clear doesn't have to give anything for the first five years. And in the second five years, it will, they will discuss it if it's appropriate. And you have seen again who are the leaders of the ANC, the Europeans, and that there is no way in which the Africans in the ANC are prepared for the onslaught that the Europeans are doing for them. So within these aspects, one probably now will say, and I heard some, some folks have been telling me, how do you know? You, if they had followed the life of Mandela, they would have realized that he didn't go to jail for being black. He didn't go to jail for being an African. He went to jail for protecting the information of a client he represented as his lawyer, not for being an African nationalist or anything like that. And therefore, I knew, based upon the, the release, it had to be something very b important because the man for the PSC who was released on the same date as Mandela was in prison 15 months before Mandela and left the same time as Mandela, yet the press played up nothing about this man who died two weeks later after he was left from out of prison. But there were more other things that I knew that made me made a statement I did. Uh, in the case of the rabbi, as you notice, the rabbi was saying, yes, Dr. Ben is right halfway, but and this other way, he isn't right. That the Jews were not, that Judaism didn't come out of Africa. Then he turns around and say, well, yes, there was the time with Abraham, as he said, that the Jews were there. And I said, for 400 years, Moses and all of them were, they became, if they were, and there never was anything, and they, they became what they were supposed to be while in Egypt, and they all were born there, in, except uh, Abraham and, and Joseph and the few other uh, people there. We have a habit of supporting popular situation rather than correct situation. If the thing has the popularity of the time, we support it. And anyone who dares to challenge it, we do not ask the challenger, do you have facts? And then examine the facts that the challenger put forward. But we reject the challenger solely because the person's in view is popular. This week, uh, last weekend, we had a popular 
uh, situation of buying clothes, uh, regardless of what the quality of clothes was, we were out there demonstrating for an affair that never took place. We were out there talking about Osiris, his son, I'm using the Western term, his son Horus, and Osiris' wife and Horus' mother, Isis. We were celebrating, first we were mourning the death of the son and celebrating the resurrection of the father. We were celebrating the resurrection of a penis, a hard on. <laughs> and don't know it. When we spoke of Jesus' resurrection, we do not know that we were speaking about Osiris receiving back his penis which had been cut up, cut off and thrown in the river Nile and eaten by a Nile catfish with it returned because this most faithful of African women, as most Africans are, and most African men cannot, I mean, most African women are, and most African men cannot understand it because their masters have already told us that black women are no good, and so we don't marry a, a much many of them, especially when we could throw a baseball or a football or some of their ball. <laughs> now, we, we do not examine, as I said before. And so the big fiasco went on. And had we known that the resurrection meant when Isis appealed to God Ra to give back her husband his manhood so that he can again secure for the world a good God because he has, I, was murdered by his brother the bad god, which you call a devil, said Typhon. And so God had given him back his penis. But the penis was given back as a dead penis, lying straight horizontally. And it is the resurrection of the penis so that Isis could come and lay on the pyramids and become impregnated by immaculate conception. And we carry this away. We listen to our slave master telling us that this came from Rome. I don't know how you can deal with the Immaculate Conception from Rome, a faggot, and then, and then speak of it as if it had anything to do with Europe. But then, I do know why you can do that, because when I look in your Bible, and I look in your home, even in your toilet, and see the person you have up there, it's the same man that whip your ass every day. The slave master. I mean, with you, with your daddy, with your mommy, and I know some of you are already, especially some of you are new, are already uh, sad. You said, God, what I have come into. <laughs> well, you're coming to the truth for a change. And had you, had you been to Egypt, if not with me, but at least been to a place called Dendera, another place called Abydos, immediately you would know what I am speaking is the truth because you would have seen the story of Isis and Horus. You would have immediately, when you saw this picture, because you may not have gone with me before my discussion with, excuse me, with the rabbi, Rabbi Seltzer, but I have seen that video again, you would then have known that Rabbi Salsa himself may not have gone to uh, Abydos and Denner. Or if he had gone to Abydos and Den Denner, because of his interest had to protect the position he took. Remember that Rabbi Salsa not only represented the ADL at that time, but Rabbi Salsa was the president of the local Great Neck NWCP and the local Urban League. He was the multi-genius of Great Neck. <laughs> and he had to say, he had to protect, because those of you who are Christian, Jews, and Muslims, 
Rabbi Salsa was defending you. He was defending you because you have endorsed what he stated and what he stood for. Because whether or not you call yourself Jews or Muslim or Christian, you are tied to the Adam and Eve syndrome, which has nothing to do with life in fact. Had you, had you gone at any time to Egypt, you would have known that number one, the entire Nile Valley civilization preceded Adam and Eve by thousands of years. There was no mention of Adam and Eve anywhere in the world. Since it is the Jews, or Hebrews, or Haribo, any of those names you want to use, since it is that they are the ones that gave you the concept of an Adam and Eve, if of a beginning of the world starting with a God by the name of Jehovah, you would have known that it could not have been a fact because there isn't a single Jew alive before Abraham. Abraham is said in your Bible, in your Torah, in your uh, 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 Quran, to have been the first of the Jews born in the city of Ur in Chaldea. Now the rabbi had to make a double up and that because he said they were Mesopotamians. They know thing about the, them being Mesopotamian. It said he was born in the city of Ur, that's what the Bible said, in the nation of Chaldea, and at Chaldea they admitted, as the rabbi did, was at the time controlled by African people. The same African people, by the way, who had traveled from the Nile Valley all the way, you're going to hear it next week, all the way to India and established the first uh, 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 statutory rules and sacred laws of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Indian book. The, the people you call Dravidians or Tumul or Dalit. Either name, when I had been saying that for umpteen uh, years gone back, way in the 30s, I was accused then of trying to be Indian. I, I, it's the last thing I want to be. I'm, so, I'm, I'm very happy being an African, so if, if obviously no one knew me much. It's just like people trying to say that I marry uh, a, a white woman in Egypt. I know the person who said that doesn't know me very well. So I kind of ignored that, but for some of you that I consider a human being, I felt it's necessary to remind you that it is still me, and I haven't gone crazy yet. Now, now there is a, a, another factor that this title today presupposes. The philosophical ethnical masterpiece. A week or so or more, in the Wall Street Journal, I'm getting in high places in America, a professor, Mary Lefkowitz, felt it necessary to attack me because I gave a lecture at a very nice white school for white uh, girls, where a few African women, I hope, I hope you understand how I phrase that, it's a school for white girls, and a few African women are attending there. I guess the scholarship is very good, so I don't blame them. And I, this professor sat there. She teaches classic. And because I said the Greek were not classical, therefore they can't teach classics. The only thing classical about the Greeks were the classical faggots. And that's the only thing, especially for most of you who are members of the upper dapper, lapper, kappa dapper, feather. <laughs> you, I know that I'm hurting a lot of your feelings, but I generally do that, so don't feel bad. <laughs> don't feel bad until I tell you what the whole story is, then you know that you're real upper dapper, lapper. Because until I get I could speak all afternoon, and I should not have mentioned even the word Greek. I could speak for two more weeks and don't reach the Greeks because they're not around yet. That goes for the Romans too. 
I could speak another two weeks and don't reach Adam or Eve. And will be still speaking what the Africans did. So when the rabbi admitted that yes, some aspect of Judaism did start in Africa. What do you mean by some? Some is more than three. And if I got 10, some, and, you, and you're talking about three, it's not the half. What I'm saying, that the little percentage that didn't come from Africa in Judaism doesn't make up 2% of 100. I am saying that if my mother gave birth to me, certainly my mother gave birth to me to a certain orifice which all of you come out, not my mother, but somebody, some mother, every one of you come to it. The mere fact that I go back into an orifice doesn't make that other woman my mother. The mere fact then that Judaism come through the orifice of Africa and then went to Asia to go into the orifice don't mean that Judaism is an Asian reli uh, African religion. And I want to make it clear for those of you who are Jewish, you said Ben Yekin and say that Ju Judaism is Jewish. No, Judaism is a, far, is a fraud, just like Christianity and Islam. It's a fraud because it does not recognize its mother. And any child that disrespect its mother by declaring she is not his or her mother is a fraud. If Judaism could say that any one of its prime members and the first member of Judaism is Avram, he's the first of all Jews. If they could say that Adam, Ad, Abram knew anything and wrote anything, published anything, taught anything that was contrary or before or different to what the ancient Africans of the Nile Valley was teaching, then I'm willing to succumb and say, yes, it is valid. It's a religion all by its own and started on its own. It started in Asia as an Asiatic black man's organization. You listen to Asiatic black men, because listen to it very carefully. There's a lot of jive going down by a crazy man who following another crazy man who is dead that's saying that I, when I die, I'm going to come back white. And I'm going to get straight here. And I'm going to have a narrow nose. And I'm going to have thin lips. If God, if there's a God and does that to me, we're going to have a fight. <laughs> now, he probably wants to be that way because he's no different than Michael Jackson in his thinking. Now, let me get it straight now. Let me get it down here. <laughs> If anyone plus the rabbi can show me any Jewish writing before that attributed to a man that said born in the city of Goshen in Egypt, and as I remind you, each time I go to Egypt, I make sure that it hasn't gone anywhere, that it is still in Africa, because the day it leaves and goes somewhere else, I'm not going there. Now, now, it is a fact then that we see that the first piece of writing attributed to the Hebrews is a book called Exodus, not even Genesis. Because Genesis, and the rabbi had to admit, is an afterthought. The four books of the Torah was written before Rabbi Hagrippa and Rabbi Hillel finally found out that, oh, we're talking about leaving Egypt, and we're not in the world yet. <laughs> so that the Council of Jamia does decide to write a book called Genesis, the word meaning beginning. And so they had to find a chumped up beginning and base it upon some craziness, and therefore we have adopted. Oh, look, am I, I think in a Sunday I'm going to mess up with you and your religion. <laughs> now, but I'm going to do it, continue. See, you're going to leave before I leave. Now. <laughs> you see, the truth got a funny way to rub you, and it rub you the bad way. Because uh, most of you women here, if I say 
that the Bible is garbage, you get mad. But I'm going to prove it with, with one other thing. The Bible got you as the one who started sin. Eve caused sin for the forbidden fruit. Now, you know, most of you believe it. Most of you believe that Eve started, and if she didn't start it, she cooperated with Adam. And most of you believe that's why you have pain, those of you who are mothers, get birth to your child. You know why you believe it? You're stupid. <laughs> and why you stupid? You see the baby when it's in your hand. Now you notice that the baby got a head at least five inch diameter. <laughs> and you know you got your vagina isn't five inch. Otherwise you need a camel or, or, or elephant. <laughs> so now you know that the reason you have pain giving birth is the head. And you know when you look at the shoulder, and that's 11 to 12 inches, you know that if your vagina was at least five, it ain't 12. <laughs> now you know definitely why you got the pain. Ain't got nothing to do with any sin. You, you, do, you, do you see my logic there? I'm trying to reason with you in everywhere possible that you could understand the truth I'm dealing with. Now, you may hear something else from the minister, from the rabbi, from the imam, different to that Friday, Saturday, and today. But you notice that they don't discuss anything, that they don't break down anything to you, because if they break it down, if they give you dates, you're not going back next Friday, next Saturday, next Sunday, and that sucker ain't gonna have no money. Now, you understand, I had to stop to break that down to you because you may like me in one way, but now when I come in close to you, Jesus, or, you know what I mean, or your Allah, or your Jehovah, now I'm messing with you. I plan to mess with you because I want you to get straight. All right, now, when the rabbi as others talk and when we see here the philosophical and ethical masterpiece, we must understand the philosophical, and everybody ha must deal with philosophy. Any group of people are together because of philosophical reasons. You don't have to write it down in a book. It's automatic that if a group of people stay together, there is a philosophical basis for their being together. It's equally uh, 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 given that they are there are ethical reasons, or at least an ethical reason, for their being together. They set up a set of morals, and that moral set of morals become a code. And each person is expected to behave according to, <coughs> excuse me, his position or her position within that compact of people. Now, no one could deny this. Thus, when, it, when I said that is a lie that the Greeks were the first to deal with philosophy, it didn't need any great thinker to come up with a conclusion. Since the Greeks were not the first people in the world that we know of, then they living together philosophically could not have been the first. And therefore, their writing about it could not have been the first philosophical concept when the ancient people along the Nile, Ethiopian, Egyptians, uh, people of Tamari, let's call them by the modern na name, the Sudan, Sudanese, and, and different things, Uganda, because that's the beginning of the Nile, is in Uganda and Ethiopia. Those people had already written, and written in terms of their theosophical beliefs and philosophical beliefs. We can go back to the Twa. Uh, and, the, and the Hutu people, the smallest people on the face of the earth. And we could see them presenting long before writing as we know it, going back into the uh, archaeological forms. We could see the Twa and Hutu people, and more so not only in the centroid part of East Africa, but we saw them and still see them at the southern tip of Africa which they themselves call at one time Monomotapa, before we are now hearing Azania and um, uh, uh, Azania and the next name. Um, uh, 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 
No, no, no. The southern tip, the, the divide. Azania, no. No, no. There's another name. Northwest Namibia. I, I still don't call them that because they have ref uh, African people have changed the name from Monomotapa because the white folks said that the Monomotapa, the ruler of Monomotapa, was a bad man and he had killed the missionaries. He was a good man. <laughs> and the name should go back to remind young Africans of that part of the world one of the obligations they have. And one of the obligations they have is to learn how to kill white folks. It is equally your obligation, because one day you're going to have to do it. I, I heard you are now satisfied that half of the beaters have been convicted. So at least we got half of justice. So Rodney King will get a few million dollars which he's unable to spend because he's like a jellyfish, uh, talking about we, n we have to come together. <laughs> and now we are all entrepreneurs, so we don't mind about a Rodney King. And everybody was worried if the brothers are going to challenge the police and open arms since the police have shown the amount of military hardware they have in hand. If they were found innocent, do you, I, excuse me, I don't think the brothers in California were stupid enough to attack the police in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is not the only city in California. You attack any place where the cracker was and is. Maybe the White House. It doesn't matter. A cracker is a cracker is a peck of <laughs> Now let me go on again. Because some of you may believe that an Egyptologist should not think as I do. That all I should be talking about Egypt. But I, I have to bring in, you see, the, the reason I am an Egyptologist is because I know the past and I know how it affects the present. Now, let's continue. Rabbi Seltzer, and he has since been banished out of Great Neck, having been mistreated by Yosef Ben Yohan. <laughs> Rabbi Seltzer had failed to recognize that the foundation of Judaism, which is the foundation of Christianity, which is the foundation of Islam, because that's the manner in which these three religion, and you could call it what you want, started. First, there was an Abraham, then there was a Jesus, the Christ created by Pantheus and Boethius, and then there was a Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, who dealt with this term God in the Arabic language, and that uh, language uh, uh, is no different than any language. Whether you call the deity in Arabic Allah, or you call the deity God, or you call the deity Dio, it still means the deity, the male form of the deity. Of course, it is a problem by which Abraham and all of them had. It seems as if that the Hebrews or Jews, whatever name we want to call them, had gotten afraid of their women, as they did with the Adam and Eve story. And they finally they decided to deny their mama the proper place she held in world reality. She had given birth to the bastards and should have turned her foot when they were coming out and snapped their neck. But like most women, they were being kind and allowed these monsters to grow up to the point of writing a book and taking her out of it. So the Jews could not deal with a goddess any longer because they couldn't deal with their mama, much less the woman that they were sleeping with. So they had to remove the woman out of the picture and she could no longer be a, the deity. In the case of the Christian, uh, 
the, the, Af the Christian male could not deal with the woman either. So therefore, Jesus' mother, who was the mother of God according to the Christians, had to be removed from her position of goddess. The Christian man, who had lost his testicles and everything else, and if he had it, wasn't functioning properly. And therefore, the woman must shame them by performing, and he couldn't respond. And therefore, it was necessary at the Nicene Conference to remove Mary from an honored position that they had copied in terms of Isis. Isis had fulfilled her sexual obligation to Osiris. She had given Osiris sex to the point of a child. But what had happened after Osiris was killed by this evil brother, said Typhon, Isis found herself unable to produce a child with a dead man. This is the situation with most of our Christian folks because many of us are having sexual intercourse with the Lord. As a matter of fact, all the nuns are married to the Lord, Jesus. Of course, uh, after he's failed, they come to me and... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, someone a billion. Do what the Lord cannot do. Because the Lord did not do it on earth, you all said. At 33, I mean, that's stop reason this thing. At 33 years of age, you said that a man come down in a polygamous country where everybody having an extra wife or 10 or, five or 50 or more, and that man didn't touch anybody at all, that he went to a big wedding and saw the people having a fun, and he sat up there, make sneaky feet, why you call it, and had a good time. When everybody was grabbing on some woman, he was right there just watching. And every time you see him, we were 12 men. <laughs> now it's up for you to draw your own conclusion and not blame me for this. You've got to do, use your reasoning. Ask, if you had asked, to see at least one of the 18 books that were taken out of your Bible, then you would understand that that was a lie. That J.C. was going to bed with Martha. J.C. had thrown a little boy off the roof because you would have written, you would have read the 18 books and you would have read the Aquarian Gospel. And you would have seen the other side of the life of Jesus that your minister and rabbi, I, I mean, and, 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 and uh, what a prophet or whatever they call themselves, had denied you. You would have seen that he acted as a normal man. He acted as a normal man in the synagogue when he whipped asses one day, <laughs> over short change in the money box. You would have seen that, but you can't see it. You're still mad. I could look in some of your face, you, you're paining, you're hurting. You're hurting because I'm talking about a man that had s sex with that woman as your man have with you, if he's much of a man. Now, but you can't have that. Because since sex is sexual, you can't have Jesus getting laid. Because you know sex is bad. Because your sex is messed up. You believe everybody's sex is messed up. So JC couldn't have had sex. Yet God made the penis and the vagina. You know, if God, if, if sex is bad, God is responsible for it. He made Adam with clay and whatnot. <laughs> and he attached a penis to Adam. Obviously, it was at least half Adam he made before he put the penis on. Because he got to get, either whether he come down or go up, at midsection he slapped the penis in there. <laughs> In the case of Eve, he must have done it the same way. Even though he took the flesh from Adam at Robert Adam's rib cage. I mean, you know you're getting mad, you're getting mad. But am I correct? Am I reason, is my reason, reasoning logical? Is your belief logical? I mean, look at yourself. You don't have to take off your clothes now. Just think back this morning how you look. And see if I'm not describing the way you look, right? All right, I mean, then you know I'm right. But you can't say I'm right because the cracker wrote a book. 
and put it in your hand with all kind of pictures. And you know it was you in the picture. Because you know you're white. <laughs> now, understanding this clearly, we have to understand and don't fail because when I went up here to Michigan the other night, I spoke for two fraternities and a sorority joined with another group to sponsor me. And I told them when I got there, I said, I'm very, very happy that you all brought me, but you all don't go feel good about me when I leave. Because <laughs> I'll have to talk with you and them Greeks. And them freaks. <laughs> because the, the truth isn't varied by virtue of the money in the collection plate. The truth is the truth irrespective of who sponsor me. And you're going to hear it. And then I told them, this, I was brought there to speak, listen to it, a conference of black male on white campuses. And the conference had at least 30% crackers. So I asked them, what are these crackers doing in here? <laughs> this is a conference for black males on white campuses. And I see all of these cracker women. I said, are these your women? I mean, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm asking. I didn't say the word. And, and I asked, uh, which one of you white women going with this, which black man in here? That put a little chill in the community because I, a few of them didn't want to know who they were going with, so they uh, w couldn't deal with it. But anyhow, one, the thing that happened to people is that we are accustomed to all of these frauds. And when the fraud hit us on our head, we cannot make the change. And we condemn the person who comes to us and say, here, there's a fire. See, the smoke, it didn't, the smoke didn't come by itself. The smoke is coming from a fire. Let us search for the fire. And you who are dealing with the smoke said, no, it is smoke, but no fire. This is a special smoke. It comes from a white man. And if a white man said there's no fire, even though there's smoke, there ain't no fire. I came to you to explain that the reason we can be lulled to sleep with a half decision in the Rodney King case is no difference than we can lull to be lulled to sleep Friday at the mosque, Saturday at the synagogue, and Sunday at church. Because we got a half of the truth, a half of the truth that started in Africa. And the reason is that we are not willing to deal with the truth. For those of us who see brothers and sisters, whether from Haiti or, or from the west coast of Africa, practicing the worship of God, Vudum, have difficulty even respecting the, 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 the religion voodoo. We have followed, and any comedian goes on the radio, could make joke about voodoo and voodoo. And there's no objection to us. Nobody writes in to the, to the editor or to, the, or to the anybody. But let somebody come and make joke about Jesus, Mary, Joseph, Allah, and Jehovah, and you will send a ton of letters overnight. The fact is, if I said Jesus, Allah, and so forth, I heard no grimaces, but let me say Unkulunkulu, the god of the Amazulu. Let me say Ngai, the god of the people of the Agukuyu of Kenya, and so on and so on. It generally, gener but even let me say, other than that, let me say that the Ginkgo tree is God. And immediately you got a word for me. I'm an ominous. Now I don't know what that what you mean by that, and I don't think you know what you mean either. But what do you mean? What's wrong about being an ominous? Because I go to the tree, I wish to cut down the tree as a firewood, or to make a bed for my children or myself to lay on. And so I get there and say to the tree, while watching the beautiful leaves uh, uh, toss it in the, in the breeze, uh, and I say to the tree, tree, I have to speak to you and ask you permission 
to cut you down uh, because I'm sorry. I realize that you're alive. How? In the world I live in, I must use you. You are related to me, yes. We are in the same world. But my interrelationship with you, I have to use you in this manner in order to sleep. I will not cut you down just to put you in my living room to show my friends. I will do as some people do, big, the big hunter who comes to Kenya and with a telescopic lens 500 miles away almost, <laughs> kill the lion and is a big hero. Uh, he doesn't take the knife and go with his mouth and then grab the lion, give the lion a fair chance and then, <laughs> and, and then kill. But now I, I'm talking to the tree and I'm saying to the tree the reason and you get there and say, look at that stupid man. He's talking to a tree. Well, I'm talking to a tree that thinks better than you do. So your Bible said he looked like a man, but he walked like a tree. That's why you tell you. But does it is it does, is it a literal fact, or is he saying that the man, my, looked like a man, but I walk like a tree. I don't move. I shake. I roll. I move. But still, I'm steady. My both, both feet are standing at the earth at the same place. In our case, we are moving, but we are worse than the tree. We are worse than the tree because now we are talking about ecology. But your African ancestor, by talking to the tree, had his built-in ecology. Because he didn't cut down any tree for any frivolous reason. He cut down a tree only when it was basic to his livelihood. And there we come to the concept here of what's ethical, what's philosophical in the origin. The origin of taking cognition of what we have as an African people and not losing it. I noticed the book of uh, uh, Dr. Blyden has been reprinted outside there, and I'm glad for the person who brought it back. But then we let us go back to Blyden since we brought the book and see Blyden, Blyden spoke of this in another perspective. Blyden spoke of this in terms that we can't deal with it. We speak of our women in terms of a Christian background morality, a Muslim background morality, a Hebrew background morality. We do not treat our women in an African, regardless of what country or what culture from Africa, background. That's one of the reasons for our plight, our struggle with our woman. She becomes a counterpart. We speak of our relationship between men and women as if two soldiers on the battlefield. I went and I asked these young, young people up at Michigan, the next time you invite me, please invite me to a conference of black women and black men. I am tired of going to conferences of black women complaining about black men and black men complaining about black women. The reason you got to complain is because you can look at yourself. The night I went there, the first night, after the afternoon conference, they had a dance. I wasn't surprised. So they're going to forget everything they had during the day. But at the dance, I went there to look and see if black women are holding black men or, and black men are holding black women. And I stood there, and the young man or the young woman comes in front. They are going to get up here this time. He comes, and there's a girl standing there, and he stopped, he made like this. <laughs> she got up, and he made like this. <laughs> and she doing the same thing. Never once did they touch each other. <laughs> Never once. And then, being in the subway to show you how bad things are going, I was in the subway. Uh, I had enough courage to go down there. 
keeping my hand in my pocket for bluffing somebody that I had <laughs> something. Because when I call the subway, I always do this. For, and then look mean for the brother figure, don't mess with him. <laughs> but in the subway, I heard a young man, very nice, handsome looking young man, hello to a very beautiful young lady. Hey, bitch, come here. And the young lady came, what you want, baby? And he said, bitch, and I tell you. So I stood there. I thought he was speaking to a bitch, so I'm looking for the bitch. <laughs> and I didn't see any female dogs. I know you're not supposed to have a dog on leech or not on leech in the subway. And then I, I wonder, how could he be speaking that kind of English to a dog? But when I realized this, this young lady responding, I said, oh, she's a bitch. Oh, she don't have four legs. So I couldn't withstand it and when I asked the young lady, did you hear what he called that other girl? He called her his bitch. And she said, yeah, that's his bitch. <laughs> and, I, and I said, Do you, are you a bitch for somebody else? She said, yeah, I got me. <laughs> yeah. So I said, I, I said, I, I couldn't. So I call up one of my granddaughters because I want to get this thing together. I know I'm getting to be a fossil. I'm getting rather old. And I, and I said, Tracy, are you a bitch? She said, Granddaddy. I said, it's a good, uh, I mean, I just asked. She said, how could you ask me such a question? I said, do you respond to a man, a young man calling you a bitch? She said, no, that'd be the last time you talked to me. I said, just want to check, I want to check. <laughs> so, and I called a few of them. I called a few of them to find out if this was the general thing. I found out it was the general, but there were one or two young ladies who had the decency left in them yet to refuse a young man, and that will, if a young man ever say to her, they will never speak to him again. But the, the reason all of this happened is because we were given the false premise that we were told in the first place down and in the, in the kind of, to look down on our women. So therefore we could call them any name at all. We were even told, and our daughters are told, that a man can't even look at her as a sexual object. Most women, and black women I met today, he looking at me like I'm a sex object, you damn right. <laughs> when I look at you, good as you look, you look like a sexual object. I don't look at no man as, as no subject object. <laughs> Ain't nothing he got that interests me. <laughs> but when I look at you, good as black women look, you damn right. My mind is going like a clock. <laughs> You got I me, mean, when, when I look at you sisters, you get to me. I don't know about these brothers, they may be sick, some, some um, problem, you know, that need a urologist. But, but, but uh, even at 73, I get turned on when, when I look at the sisters, and that's any one of you, even if you're with your husband. But I, I, I got a control mechanism, a control mechanism that said, dung boy, you gotta behave yourself. <laughs> but, but I still, you see, anytime you're going out with this sick European woman, that they husband look at them as a piece of furniture, or they go to buy a new dress, and the dress and them, you know, so they come in to tell you, and you fell for it, that if the man, a brother look at you good as you look, then he is supposed to see nothing sexual about you. Then why should he talk to you about marriage? You're not in sexual. You want to marry with a faggot? You want to marry celibate? I mean, then you need to marry. Marry a frankfurter. <laughs> Just go to, go to the store and order a dozen. <laughs> no. It, we, you see, I'm, I want to talk to you. I, and frankly, see, you notice that I'm not going on to all this highfalutin English talk. I'm talking to you basic because Nobody has spoken to you, obviously, basically. We all come to show you what, how good we did taking our PhD. And 
and that PhD is jamming us up, jamming us up everybody else with this uh, uh, and other things. So basically, what this suggests to me, the title today, understanding Alkevalan's original philosophical eth ethical masterpiece is a masterpiece that the Africans created our ancestors way back there if we now had stand by this masterpiece. I do not mean that we have to go around, get rid of your car, you, don't, you decide to go to the airport walking from here to Newark Airport. I don't mean that jump on, a, on the biggest turkey you saw, see and try to ride it. I don't, I don't mean that. Don't, not even jump on a jackass back and try to go to the airport because the plane gonna be in the next place and you ain't gonna be at the airport yet. I don't mean that, but I mean the fundamental principles for which our ancient ancestors stand, those fundamental principles we can apply in modern life today. I could be driving a 12-year-old car and still dealing with modern fundamentals. Uh, it is a mistake that we tell our children, and we agree with our children, that we are in two different worlds, and that there, that, that we're in, t you got another thing you call about uh, uh, the, the child is in uh, something, I, I forget what you said, but it indicate that the child is at a different life than you. This is impossible. Generation gap. Generation gap. If you are living today, and your child is living today, you are in the same generation. You are still in the same world. You are still thinking, and hopefully, you are thinking that much as you can advise your child, your grandchild, and gra great grandchildren, and so on. For, for. So it's a myth to tell the child that we are operating in a different generation. If your child is not dressed properly, and some of you trying to outdress your children in ignorance, I mean, some of you are so dressing that I, you're standing up and I see the bottom of your drawers, and, and then you tell me it's the style. Now, how in the world, how in the world your teenage daughter is trying to hide herself and you've got your ass showing? I mean, let's say what it is. Let's say what it is. And then you come in the subway. If you're standing up, I see in the bottom of your drawers. Now you decide to sit down. And I'm a vigorous man. <laughs> sitting on the opposite side. And you can't get your drawers down much as your dress. And I angle myself to see, to get a proper angle that I can see the stuff. Because it's cute stuff. And then you watch me and say, I'm a dirty old man. There's nothing dirty about me. I am healthy. It's good stuff to see, and I want to look at it. The fact that you got good stuff and don't know you got good stuff is not my fault. I know it's good stuff. I know it needs protection from me. I know you need to build up a curiosity in me to want it. And I know I'm supposed to fight for it. But you're telling me, you need to fight here it is. You could touch the shaman anytime you want. No, no. We got to say, because I've seen two young ladies right here in front of the, we we got a set uh, for the men. The brothers now got pants. The pants are so tight in the behind. The other day I, I try a pair, well under the pair of trousers, and I put, I put on the thing. I said, "Damn, this feel like a girdle." I, I I haven't had a girdle, but I saw my daughters when they were young putting on girdles. That time they used to wear girdles, and this thing looked just like a girdle. And I see the sisters. They must grease themselves and jump on the roof down <laughs> to 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 get at these things. I mean, let us, I mean, we got to come back to some sanity. If you understand who's designed the clothes down in the garment industry, then you understand that them faggots are trying to, that what they're trying to do is disgrace you. They are putting you in such clothes that your men get disgusted of them so that they could get your men. You understand? You understand, if they make you look like your man, why should a man want you? Ain't got no problem with him. They get sex and they ain't got no expense because he ain't gonna get pregnant, don't care how we try. 
Therefore, he doesn't, you, you get the picture. Now, <laughs> one has to, we see, we are coming together and dealing with all these philosophical things, but not bringing the, the esoterical part. We're talking about the esoterical. And forget the exoterical, that one isn't separate from the other. It's like me, uh, you know, you in the street, and you get hit by a car, and a doctor comes up. And he said, oh, she got come from fracture of the leg. But I can't touch her because I'm a heart man. <laughs> no, he been to school, medical school. He learned the entire body. But he decided to specialize on the heart. You mean to tell me he can't deal with a compound fracture? The other day, I went to a doctor, I wouldn't call a name. And the man had to give me and take, draw some blood. He had to call his nurse because he hadn't taken blood in a long time. Now I could have died because I need that damn thing. What kind of a doctor has reached to the point that he can't take some blood? He's lost that skill. So it meant, it meant that all he could do is handle a heart. And that's what I mean, is that we have modernized with quotation marks, ourselves to the point that the ethics, the ethical mastery, the ethics within even medicine. Can you imagine me calling Imhotep and said to Imhotep or his mother or any of the physicians there or any of the physicians who left us medical treaties going back as far as 2000 before the common era and say to them, you know, a man is down the street, a woman is down the street. She broke her leg, she has a compound fracture. And he said to me, no, I can't handle her because I only deal with the heart. And talking about the heart, we have to stop dealing with the heart as an abstract. I love you, young ladies. You don't love nobody with your heart. You love with your mind, you understand? Let your mind do the thinking. When you love with your heart, that's when you get in trouble. Because the heart doesn't love. It has no capacity to love. The heart is a muscle, the biggest muscle in your body. And its only function is pumping the blood. That's the only function. It is a myth to say, and I don't care what book it's written in, you love with your heart. No. We must de it, with dealing with the reality. You call, brother come to you and act not brotherly and persist in misbehavior. You then use your mind and reject him outwardly from the mind to your lips and tell him what has to be told. Don't wait on your heart to do anything because you're gonna be pregnant before the heart say anything. <laughs> now, these are things that we need to know. And we need to know them uh, by virtue of the certain respectability I need to call on. And this I have not seen. I had to speak to some the brothers and sisters up at the conference because I had seen uh, a few sisters at the conference and they were pregnant. And there's nothing wrong with pregnancy and there's nothing wrong with pregnancy when you're young. I don't, my mother was 19 years old when she got pregnant with me. Uh, but there was something else besides the pregnancy. My father, had paid her the proper respect. And therefore, he had won the rights for the most gracious thing she had, heaven. You see, my father knew that heaven wasn't someplace in the air beyond where the airplane goes. My father knew that my mother had heaven. And his mother had heaven. And heaven is the place that all of us came from. It is so my father addressed her with a proper respect for her to give him 
the authority, the, do the key to the doors of heaven to enter. Now, what is that proper respect? Which I am not seeing. Uh, right the, today, today my son and my wife, after four, are on a boat. Left Florida on its way to the Bahamas and other places. He, my, my son is getting married to a young lady on the boat. Uh, they have a boat and the honeymoon and everything like you. You say, well, why I am not there? I have other obligations, and my wife is representing me. Uh, but why is he marrying this young lady? Is the young lady pregnant? No, that's no reason to marry. That will be the last reason to marry because somebody pregnant. You marry because you have a certain feeling for a woman. And your economics is correct. You see, he's got a very good job. He should have had a business. But he got a very good job. She has a very good job. Now, that's logical basis for marriage. You can't be no job. <laughs> Waiting on mama and daddy. And you so much in love that I got to marry. You ain't got a pot to piss in, no window to throw it out of, and you go get married. <coughs> huh? Now you said, as long as I love him and he love me, you can stop together like that. <laughs> and die. <laughs> no. I told my son, if she's good enough to lie in bed with, then she's good enough to marry. You're not doing no heaven and God and, and nothing like that. The one I told my son, do not lay in bed or the ground with what is not good enough to be a wife. So that, so that if she gets pregnant, now dealing with the possibility, because there are possibilities. If when you're laying with her and she gets pregnant, you ain't got no problem marrying her. Because before you lay with her, she's good enough to be a wife. So then if there's an emergency, you do it voluntarily. Her mother or father don't have to talk to you about it. Because you start out respecting her, knowing that she has the capacity and quality to be a wife. Now if she doesn't have that, masturbate before you lay with her. Because you don't want your child being born from any and anything. You understand? And if she's not of the quality that meets the standard of your family, then don't touch her. You understand? Now, and, and that's part of what we have lost. And that's part of why there are so many sisters who have children and swear if she see the brother she will throw a pot of hot lie on him or at least she desired to do it even though she don't have the strength to do it I could understand it because the ethical and philosophical aspect that our ancestors came under, we have given this up for the Western love. So thus we say, on the day of our betrothal, the day we decided to marry the man or marry the woman, depending on the case may be, we say the same day, I want to be as far from my mother-in-law as I can. Shouldn't we want to be as close to our mother-in-law as we can? What happened to the extended family? Well, we should, we don't. Because we said, as soon as I'm old enough, I'm going to move from my mother's house. Because now we are modern. We get rid of a pair of shoes as soon as it's walked on three times. So as soon as I feel that I'm a man, I keep getting that hard on and it's not to pee. 
It is time to move on, and that's our ethics. Whereas, when we go home, the daughter cannot move from her mother's house. No more can the son move from his mother's house until they're married. Well, that protects the dignity of the woman. It protects the dignity of the household. It protects the ethical value because what it's saying, why countries that have that kind of behavior, take Egypt, where a man, if he's Muslim, can have as much as four wives. Yet there are very few family where a man have two wives, much less four. It is not economic only. It is because marriage is regulated by the family. And a man cannot move from his mother house, no more can a woman unless they are married. If you do, the family will read you out. If you marry, for example, and your work take you from one town 100 miles away to another town another 100 miles away, and your family live in this town, and let's say you have to come to this town for a reason. It is impolite to the point of the family reading you out of their family. If you should go to a hotel and not to your mother or your aunt, you must stay with a member of your family even if you have to sleep on the floor. Because how could you go to a hotel and not to a member of your family. That's the ethics. Now think of it. Think of yourself. How do you feel about that? That isn't the training you had. That's not the training you had in the church. That's not the training you had in the synagogue. That's not the training you had in the mosque. And that's why we are failing. We are failing because we have taken the European value, not realizing the, re the reason the European developed this he had a, ice, a piece of metal to dig a hole in it to pull out a fish, one fish, to support that little family. So he had to kill off a certain amount of the girls when they showed up, show up. He developed a psychology based upon what he called a family, this little unit leaving out his old grandmother and grandfather. And that psychology we have adopted because we are educated in his schools. Even our universities and our colleges, when we say it's a black president, a black vice president, a black everything, even a black toilet cleaner, but the curriculum is a European white curriculum. And that is as I wind down. And that's what I mean. And I can't change my projection because I have seen the result of what I'm talking. And for the last 53 years of struggling in this arena, I have seen successes and failures. The successes that I've seen are based upon when the African man, woman, or child approach whatever they're doing from an African perspective. Yes, it is the hardest way. It is the hardest way, yet I, I feel some sort of a comfort when I speak to Mrs. Laurie Welch. You don't know the person. I'm talking about a woman who married a man, and in seven days after the marriage, he's dead. I spoke to her every morning for the last eight, nine days, and I called her. I could expect the entire story of how she was at the hospital, how he died. She, can't, she cannot open a conversation with anyone unless going to like a record, a tape recorder, because the pain is so strong. 
She can't deal with it without repeating herself and going over this tragedy. Is it because she wants to? No. It's a compelling reason beyond her control to do this. It's her dying devotion to this man that she can't as yet accept that he's dead. It is the same, somewhat the same as me this morning dialing 926 9425. I got to 9269 and then said, what, what are you doing? The man is in the funeral parlor. Because every morning, practically when I'm in New York, I was dialing Mrs. Laurie Welch's husband, Aubrey Welch, to say, are we going to eat in Champagne? Or are we going to eat in 22 West? Or oh, he's dialing me. Or sometimes I'm dialing Sister Kefa, or sometimes Sister Kefa is dialing me, or sometimes somebody is in the circle where we live, and the circle of friends that we have. And in the circle of friends that we have, the reason the pain is so much is because there is an aspect of African reality that we have gone back to. There's an esoterical base to the way we live. Some of us demonstrated by the African clothes we wear and other things. Some of us demonstrated by our behavior pattern in public to our sisters and brothers and to our loved ones. And some of us uh, demonstrated in other ways. But to me, it is most important that I live a rigid African life, yes? 53 years, and it has had some economic de deprivation. But the beauty and pain I feel give me the love Mrs. Laurie Welch feel. Though she feels this love for a man who is now lying in the funeral parlor, the love she feels for her husband is no different than the love I feel for the work I'm doing. Because you cannot separate the esoterical feeling from the exoterical reality. Love is expressed, and it's hard to give a definite, a one definition of the term, but the love for one's people is like the love for a mother, by a mother for her child, or a woman for her husband. For in either case, one is willing to put one's life as the ultimate price. And I say, the love that the woman shares for her child, for her man, it is time that that love be returned to her by the African man. And we are way behind. I say way behind because when we walk out and leave our child, 99% of the time, the African mother nourished that child. Yes, sometimes she even must take on another man, or two men, or 10 men, or do something as a steal, or prostitute, or do something. But that love, and that's the love I'm talking about, it is a disease. And I hope that we get an epidemic. Thank you. of the type of contributions that is referred to. 
and I think that we should really express our love and appreciation for Dr. Ben and all of these things. For the sisters and brothers who came in late, are the, are the sisters and brothers from Philadelphia here? Did they come? No, okay. For those of you who came in late, uh, sisters and brothers, your attention please. For those of you who came in late, we would like you to know that you can make a donation to Dr. Ben, most of us did. So just in case you came in late, we don't want you to feel left out. We don't want you to feel neglected. We'd like you to make a contribution. Just make sure you leave it at the table before you exit. The announcements are next week, First World Alliance, on Zion Lutheran Church, 145th Street and Convent Avenue at 4 p.m. Brother Velo and Amelie will be there lecturing on the Dalits of India. Sunday, he will be here at 4.30. And sisters and brothers, would you kindly keep it done, please? And we'll ask you to make sure that you make a special effort to be back here because you will see the continuity of what Dr. Ben has just shared with you. The other bit of information I have to share with you is... In whatever fighting goes on in Egypt is between Egyptian and Egyptians. Egyptians who are fundamentals, fundamentalists, and Egyptians who are Sunni. And that has, is at a very mild state. Let me give you an example. In Israel, the statement is that every 15 minutes, some sort of explosive explodes, and most of the time, somebody is killed. That's every 15 minutes every day. In Ireland, it's about every half hour, somebody is killed. But nobody suggests that they don't go to, eat, to the Israel or Ireland to visit. The crime rate in Egypt is less than one half percent among 55 million people. Uh, the, what I can say, I go all over Egypt. Just the other day, uh, two weeks ago, I took my travel agent, uh, Alkin Toshirifa, to Egypt from one end to the next, down in Aswan, so that people could see the safety. Number two, uh, we take it from another position. The fundamentalists have no argument with black people whatsoever. The argument is, is with the European, and, and, and even so, there is no major violence. You can go, for instance, you go to, to, in Egypt, you go to Cairo, to the American embassy, and they got a list of countries to be careful when you're traveling. They even list Egypt, right there in Egypt, but Israel isn't listed. Tell it, tell it. Is it a coincidence? I mean, when you talk about violence, there's no place beat Israel when it comes to violence. But nobody goes because most of your travel agency in New York are owned and run by Jews. So to knock out in Egypt, put more travelers going to Israel. You can see uh, by the car loads of people from the Bible Belt goes to Israel. And a handful will come from Israel to see the pyramids. And the pyramids are the least of the things you want to see. Yes, the pyramid, especially at Khufu, is a magnificent structure, big, large, colossal. But that's, that's, that's a, a minuscule of the things you want to see. Uh, you want to go to the Valley of the Kings, you want to go to uh, Dendera Abydos to see the basic things that we need to know. And I suggest that I would not in encourage you to come. You know why? If I thought there would be something wrong, I wouldn't encourage you because I'm on the same trip. 
I may be on the same, I will be on the same bus. If we had three buses of people, I'm gonna be on your bus because I move from one bus to the next, anybody could tell you, and I sit in your bus, and heaven knows, I have no desire to die now. <laughs> so I wouldn't be there if I thought that it was going to be unsafe. And that goes for anyone. I, I think that you're safer than going in the subway, M much, much safer. Dr. Ben, would you kindly explain to the sisters and brothers about the fact that you do live in Egypt so you know what you're talking about? Oh, yes. I, I reside in Egypt. I spent about eight months of the year uh, when you count it in Egypt and the rest between here and elsewhere. And uh, I have residency. So I, I, have, I am living the dual citizen life. Uh, anybody else could do it, I'd do it. And I, I see it. I, I could give you some statistics. For example, there's a rape mentioned in Egyptian papers, maybe one rape in every other week or month, one, in the whole country. But you know what happened? And the rapist is generally found. If he's found by the police before the family catch him, the family catch him, he's dead immediately. The police catch him, he's dead after the trial. <laughs> so they're gonna shoot him in the morning and bury him before sundown. What is a rape? A sister walk in the street, a man don't know you and touch you, and you call the police, that's rape. And he dies. I'll give you the law. What is the penalty for smoking one reefer? Upon found, you found guilt, 25 years. You got a pack? Is 20 in a pack? 20 times 25 years. No time for good behavior. You, you don't need that good behavior because you get 20 times 25 years. And, they, but they, and the point is that when they got you, they're going to get the pusher because by the time the judge see you and you standing up, you don't have anything broken, the judge is going to ask, what was this man arrested for? And you said drugs, and you say, he's still standing up? You said rape, is he still standing on his two feet? You understand me? They, they'll entertain your head as a baseball coach. And then you're gonna tell who the pusher is. Do you know in Egypt how they come for a pusher? They bring a unit out of the army, and they block off four blocks square, and they come house, to house, apartment, everybody's apartment. They're gonna find a pusher. And he better shoot it up because good night. By na tomorrow morning, he would have seen the ancestors. Now, in that country, you don't have a problem of crimes. I leave my house and the light go out on the street. I don't look up, I, it doesn't mean a thing. I never worry about it. I, there's a little park there where I live and I go there and sit down, the air get cool sometime, and just sleep. I, 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 if I, I tell you, you go to some place and you leave your pocketbook. People run behind you, then you leave the pocket because they don't want you to go to the police and say, I think I left my pocketbook in that store, and then come back and don't find it because the police get crazy. And they're gonna find it because they be, some ass is going to be whipped. Head gonna be busted. So people come <laughs> run you down to give you your wallet. Because they don't want, and if that place got the name that somebody lost a wallet in there, they better go to business because nobody else coming to buy, to buy anything in there. So that's the, the kind of uh, society. There are other things wrong, of course, but this is one of the things that you gotta say. You go to the bank, you don't go behind a wall with a glass and anything like, the bank has sit down with you like this, and he got a hundred thousand dollars there, or she, and she said, I go into the bathroom, excuse me, and leave you there with a hundred thousand. Nobody worry about you taking anything. They know you ain't gonna take anything. <laughs> because if you do, it's the last thing you took. Hotep, sir. 
understood that you came out to the sea and hope that God is the best because all this will take you to heaven. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, one is how many languages do you speak, <laughs> including dead languages or so-called dead languages? And the second question is can you give some clarity on Akhenaten's concept of monotheism being that all the other major religions use it? Well, the first, the first question is approximately seven foreign languages, but I, I speak languages that are, that are considered uh, a dialect, and then I read some, some languages that are, in fact, what they mean dead, it means it could be read, but no one can speak it since that we don't have vowels for it. And uh, a good one would be what you call Medunecha. Uh, some people going wrong saying that they speak in Medunecha, uh, that's just what it is. Uh, you can't speak it because there's no vowel. The European added some vowel to try to, you know, communicate with each other. Uh, and there, there are more than one uh, such language, and there are many languages in which we have not, uh, men have, no one seems to have decoded yet along the Nile and elsewhere. Uh, the second part of your question was, uh, the second question was, uh, I can, uh, well, monotheism, the difference, you know, there was always a monotheistic religion in Egypt. What happened is, in the case of Ra, and Ra is much more like what the Christians, Jews, and the Muslim have. The Christian Jews and Muslims say, Thou shall have no other God before me, no other God before Jehovah, no other God before Christ, and no other God before Allah. That was said already for Ra. There should be no God before Ra. The uniqueness of Akhenaten is, he did not say, No other before me. The other, those two are saying, you can have any God you want, but I must be first. Akhenaten said, no. Akhenaten said, there is only one God. That's the distinction. They didn't give room for any other to be less than. He just said, there's only one God, and his name is Atom. Hope to talk to them. How are you doing? Uh, fairly well. Great, great. First of all, thank you very much for your years of scholarship and sharing that scholarship with us. We very much appreciate it, very humbly. Uh, question I'd like to ask you to assist me in my arguments. Uh, what was the first book uh, in what is commonly referred to as the Bible, and at what date was well, if you're dealing with the Bible, and you're speaking of the Judeo-Christian Bible, book of the Old Testament, but it's called the Old Testament by the Christian, the first book was the book of Exodus. And that came out of the Sanhedrin about 700 before the Common Era. In 200 BC, before the Christian era, because of an argument with Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Agrippa, talking about the Jews were coming out of Egypt, and there is no proof or not, no statement about where they came from. They decided to have something stating where the Jews, and that created the need for the book of Genesis. And in 200, uh, BCE, they pr produced the book of Genesis, or the book of beginnings. Uh, Dr. Ben, you should mention your book, African Origins of Major Western Religions. As well, yeah, I, I generally don't <laughs> mention it, but <coughs> that will give you a, a whole thing on the Judeo-Christian Islamic uh, origin, and it's the, the basis in at the adaptation of the many of the religious principles along the Nile. Okay. 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 Okay.
even the people that we grew show we die and reading the book um, Come Before Up by Day. Um, it says that it's just the opposite, that if you eat of the fruit, you have everlasting life. What was the purpose in your opinion, in your opinion, mind, mindset to change that? Oh, what was the purpose? What was the purpose of European mindset in changing the outcome of the adage of eating the fruit of the tree and having everlasting life, life as opposed to eating the fruit and, and perishing? Well, uh, those who changed the what, uh, Nebucha, uh, in the what what the ancient Africans along the Nile taught is Nebucha, the god, the god of creation, who came out of the abysmal deep in the creation story with the gods and so forth, and the eating of the fruit of good that one should have everlasting life. And the contrary with the Judeo Christian Islamic, that if the eating and the fruit, men should ever should surely die, is because the Europeans could not conceive of a life after. Uh, when they did that, they could not realize the African concept. You had two different cultures. What is religion? First of all, we need to know what is a religion. The religion is the celebration of the highest value within a culture. That's all religion is. You take a culture and your greatest expressions are kept codified and that give you your values of your god or goddess or your deity. To expect the European living in a certain culture, an ice age as Dr. Jeffries and Dr. Clark specify, to op operate as if they live in a tropical or a torrid country would be not dealing with reality. The lifestyle of a man in the ice age as against a man coming from the hot climate, the earth climate, or the sun climate, as Dr. Jeffries would call it, uh, to produce in the same manner, to have the same moral values, would be opposite to reality. The European man had to deny, when you go in the temples, whatever temples the European built, you don't see any woman playing the major role in those temples. It's all men. From the Nord Nordics all the way down to the Mediterranean people. In the other opposite hand, when you go into the tombs in Egypt, the woman is played, she's all over the ceiling. Uh, she is shown as the universe. Uh, she's all shown as the heaven. The stars and other uh, planets and everything is painted on her body. Uh, she is in the ceiling and her vagina is shown as the portal for man. In, for example, in the temple of, 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 of Hath, uh, Hetheru, Hatha, in the little chapel, she is shown giving birth to Ra, the sun, in the morning, and the sun births, births a little tree, a little sprig of, of uh, green tree is being held in the hand of goddess Hathor, Het Heru. And she's smiling at this tree of life. The same scene at the other end, the sun is going back into her mouth. It comes through her body, through her mouth, through her vagina, back through her body. In the 24 hours of the day, life forever. Whereas the West is talking about the ending of a world, the African is speaking about a world forever. That when your life ends, it is a new cycle for you, a new world for you, 
but not the world itself being disappeared. In the African concept, there is no fire that's going to come and burn up the whole world. There will be the world continuing. You will make a transition from one world to the next so that the end of your world is not the end of his world, not the end of her world. Your world end the day you die, but a new world begin. That's the African concept. So the all world isn't going to stop at the same time. That's the European. European think that there's a line just like the Christmas, just like the same nonsense they put out with Christopher, Christopher Columbus, that the world is flat, and when you reach here, you're going to fall in a pit. Now, Columbus didn't start, didn't get, Columbus had gone to sea with the Moors and been in the Atlantic and know that you weren't going to fall any place. So he had that information. He could run the trick with the Europe, other Europeans. And the same thing is that we, the concept, look at the concept again. Whereas the European believe, when they finally got the stuff from Greece through Egypt, that they got one soul. And that one soul, when you die, is going to leave the body and go to God to, to look for one day when he comes. It's a, it's a male God. But the African th can't think of that. If, he, if you leave the body, what's there? How can the soul that gone to the deity find the body when he comes back? So the African got two souls for the body, right? The body soul, which stays with the body when the body dies. And they got the mind or spirit soul, the body soul being the car, the mind or spirit soul being the bar, that goes out to appeal for you to be entered into the next world, you and the cat, K-H-A-T. So we got the car, we got the body, K-H-A-T. We got the body soul, K-A, and we got the mind or, the mental or spiritual soul. And we even in the West want to make a distinction between the mind and the spiritual. The mind, the spiritual, and the brain, all one thing. They are all one. But we can't do that. It's just like we got it today. If you eat food, you got to be different than the men who eat herbs. Why? Why can't you eat herbs and eat food? You don't remember what you said, right? People forget that many medicines that you use, most of them you use, are made from herbs. Most of the refined medicine one use made from leaves, bush, something like that. So somebody say, well, just eat herbs. Why? With all the good tasting thing you got around here, eat both. Like um, my question is about the Asiatic, the Asiatic black man. The, um, we didn't come from Africa. We came from a place, Panagia, or it's all one. Panahu? Oh, P A N A G A G A E A Pangea. Thank you. And that whole concept. I wonder if the people who saying that. What brand of cocaine they use, or, <laughs> or is there a new thing? I understood there's a new thing beyond um, uh, what that thing, crack. I understood they got something better than crack now. Ecstasy. Or ecstasy. Somebody is in ecstasy. You know, we've been hearing that nonsense before. We even heard that Africa is named after Leo Africanos, and all kind of stupid thing. And it's stupid. I don't give a damn who said it. The person who said it was a damn fool, and still a damn fool. And anybody repeating is a damn fool. That's all I could say. I mean, they give you no, no, no source for it. Just the statement, Asiatic black man. Number one, the people from Asia don't call themselves Asiatic. They call themselves Asian. And num number two, wh where is this land? Where's the map? Let them give me a, let them tell you produce a map of where this place is, and how the people, I mean, 
we well, got this way because of a curse. Uh, we got we, we look at Noah. Noah nakedness. Noah's youngest son looked at his nakedness because his father was drunk, drank too much wine. Now if you're gonna curse somebody for misbehavior, shouldn't you curse the father? Huh? You're gonna curse this poor little son for looking at his daddy making an ass of himself. And then God go help the person curse his son. And then the two sons who can complain to the father that the little boy was looking at him, sick little boy, they ain't looking at the mama. Uh, I mean, the logical thing would look at mama. If you're going to look at somebody in the family, you will look at mama. She looked different. There's a possibility there be some action there. But looking at daddy, uh, unless you're the first faggot in the, in the, in the world, but let's do the boys went back and covered their father. They walked backwards without looking. No, how the hell do you know where he's at? <laughs> and how are you going to put the sheet down and cover the man backwards unless you're in an Olympic uh, acrobatic form? The, the worst of the story is that after the flood and they went on Mount Harab and the water subsided, Noah came out of the boat, plant vine, grape vine, before nightfall. They had gotten grapes, mash the grapes, make the wine. In less than one day, even Sneaky Pete from California, gallo wine, take 90 days. And that speeded up with all kind of chemicals. I mean, I mean, I mean well, you understand. <laughs> the whole temper. I know something about today, and we are grateful and we're grateful. I just want to ask you one uh, quick question. When did, what century did the Europeans adopt the Jewish religion? Uh, according to one of their scholars, uh, who wrote the book called The 13th Tribe. And uh, there was, uh, there's also a book called Are the Jews Erased by Kotsky? There are a number of books, but the 13th tribe specified that's around the third dynasty, I mean the third century in Europe, that the, uh, the war between two warring groups fighting that the Jews, a, a small group of people, Khazars, in Eastern Europe wanted no part of this and adopted the Hebrew religion from Hebrews coming from uh, around what we call Palestine today. That they adopted it and continue its practice. Why the European Hebrews became so powerful? Because they were in Europe at the time when Europeans were establishing colonies and they went out as colonizers with every other group. Let's take a for instance. Why do you think the name Avram, Abraham is so popular in Jamaica? They were Jewish slave trade. Why do you think the name Fuente in uh, Puerto Rico, the uh, Jewish slave master that came out of Spain, all Medina. These are former Jewish names. Even though most of these people are now Roman Catholics, they were formerly Jews who converted to Roman Catholicism during the Inquisition and all these kinds of things. We forget that those of us who are members of the Church of England is because we had English slave masters. Those of us who are Roman Catholic because we had French and Dutch uh, and, and French and other slaves. Those of us who are the Church of the Dutch Church uh, because we had Dutch slave masters and we are generally of the type of reaction according to slave masters. Most of us who are Muslim because we are Arab slave masters. Thank you. I, I didn't get it. I, I, for some reason, I think the mic. Uh, no, we ask Who came up with the concept of healing through color and music? 
healing through color and music. I don't know. Is there some people that heal you through colors and music? How? I'm just asking. It's new to me, so I'm asking. You mean one of the implements of the psychiatric treatment that you get? No, nothing bad with psychiatric. You may call it something. Some people call it um, vo um, juju. Some people call it uh, uh, witch doctor. Yeah. It's meaning the same thing, psychiatric. Okay. Now, <laughs> you're saying that the medicine man, the witch doctor, the physician, the psychiatrist, use one of the methods of healing is colors. There's nothing wrong with it. The color doesn't do anything. The color is a symbol that they an implement that this, uh, the, the physician is using, the color doesn't do anything, it's the suggestions. So the color doesn't heal nothing. And the song is the suggestion. Uh, what, the, what these people are doing is they know the society in which you live. And they know the thing that, the stimulus that they're using, they use these objects, it's like me. I could take this and hypnotize you. Or this, or this. The object is not the thing. Is the what I can use to draw your attention to focus on and hypnotize you with it. I can. Some people go hypnotize you just like doing this. It isn't the finger that's doing it. It's a suggestion. This is just the implement used to attract your attention. So the color doesn't heal you, or the music doesn't heal you. It's what the the person who controlling the mind and using that symbolism heals you. Well, I don't know of a monument that's been bombed. Well, this was the question. The pyramid. Which pyramid? Kefran. The pyramid of Kefran? It's, it's news to me because three weeks, three weeks ago I've been there and, and it's still there and I don't see anybody bomb anything. <laughs> Excuse me. Which, where you all got that from? They had, a, they had some kids that, you know, kids are going to be kids. And they went and put a stink bomb yeah. with the smoke. And first the fire department, everybody said there was a bomb in the pyramid. And I guess it went out, there's a bomb, but it wasn't a bomb in the pyramid. I've been there. I just back here, what, two and a half weeks? I live less than a mile and a half, uh, from the, uh, about a mile and a half of that, uh, about that much from the, the Pyramid of Kephram. And, and by the way, uh, please don't use the word Kephram. That name is Kafra. It's Khufu Kafra Menkara. The Greeks and Western, other Westerners use Cheops, Kephram, and Masari. Kephram is the Greek name, the Greek usage. Uh, that's, that's Kafra. Uh, uh, in many of your books, you refer to Africa as Alpha Bula. Was there ever a time in history when the whole continent of Africa was referred to as Alpha Bula? No. No. The, the, a, 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 a mass area of the continent was called Al Kebulan, uh, Ortegia, Hesperia. Amonis, Libya. In ancient times, no one knew a continent that large and its totality. Uh, they were, during the time of Makeda, she had sent someone to circumnavigate the land where they live. From the maps that she gave, they saw the two tips of two continents. One appears to be the southern tip of South America, and one, of course, the southern tip of Africa. During the time of King Neko, N-E-K-C, N-E-K-U, or it's spelled sometime N-E-C-H-O, the second, and that would be around 975 before the Common Era, he commissioned Admiral Hanno, H-A-N-O,
to circumnavigate the land because they didn't, what, what you call the word continent wasn't even used. And he went from Egypt as far as what it was called in the book, Barbatus, B-A-B-A-T-U-S. Barbatus is today called Cameroon. And it means the same, Cameroon means, Cameroon is, 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 is shrimp, Cameroon in, uh, in Spanish. And uh, Barbatus means shrimp, to the shrimp river. And that's the two earliest uh, navigation attempts we know to circumnavigate whatever that land was. One of the things that would have stopped this totality would be there were no Suez Canal at this time. The Suez Canal is only in, in the 19th century, 1885, by the Khadif Ismail. Uh, he started it, of course, and uh, spent all his money in the whole houses in France, and finally had to sell out to the British and the French. Uh, so the, 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 the Moors, and the Ethiopians use the term al kebulan and they refer to that much of the continent that they knew. Yes, Dr. Ben, there's been a lot of talk about the uh, unfairness in baseball. Jesse Jackson uh, spoke about it. Uh, a lot of unfairness in baseball. Jesse Jackson, Hank Aaron, uh, The blacks in baseball has to realize they don't own baseball. And you're gonna have the same racism in baseball you got in anything else. The racism in baseball is no different than the racism in the church, the mosque, the synagogue, or in the white, <coughs> excuse me, in the white house. <coughs> excuse me. It's one thing we got to accept and learn at least. This is a white man's country, whether you fought for the, for the white man, fight in 50 wars or not. Now, that's a reality. Now, we may feel because we were born here, because our ancestors were born here in 1900 or something, or 1800, because we came here in 1620. This cracker looked at America as his, as a European thing. He looked as the indigenous people that they, he took the land from, as this land is his. He looked to us that way, and we, well, we refused to accept it. But he, now, until we were ready to beat him, to kill him, it's going to stay like it is. And we're not willing to kill him. We're willing to kill each other. And until we stop killing each other and kill him, then we can start talking about changing. You got umpteen congressmen, uh, uh, we well, got one, uh, one sen senator now, one woman senator, I think. Uh, nothing in change. And nothing is going to change because, because well, you see, I could have all the senators making all the laws. One, take Hayaka, uh, not Hayaka, what the guy with, uh, at Chrysler, Ayakoka. Ayakoka right now could call Clinton direct in the bedroom, laying down with his wife. He got a direct call right in there. Jesse Jackson, Jackass Jackson, any Jackson. <laughs> want to talk to Clinton, he's going to get the secretary to the secretary to the secretary who got to call the administrative secretary, <laughs> who got to call the personal secretary, and he may get him today. Understand? What I'm saying, they got numerous crackers who got a direct line into Clinton's bed, bed must is the bedroom. And they could get him anytime they want. There is no one black man anywhere in America, and that go for Colin Powell. <laughs> and he is in charge of war. And he can't get the president. He gets his colon. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, I just have one other announcement. <coughs> April the 21st. There will be a trial. This is a sister, Baramina Owens, who is brutally beaten. Sisters and brothers, one answer that.